What is your spiritual identity part three? What is your spiritual identity part three? There's a handout in the back. Also, there's parts one and two are also back there if you want to take those on the way out. In part one, I covered, and by, by the way, I want to give you the free, you have the freedom. I want to acknowledge the freedom you have that you can identify whatever one of these characteristics or labels or names that you want. You, you obviously can take all of the labels and, and I take them as identification. But you can take whatever one you want. I'm telling you right up front, this one today is the one I focus on most for me personally. But that doesn't mean you have to focus on it for you. The first week we talked about being a Christian, being a believer, being a saint. And we use, we use the Bible to show the different ways the New Testament talks about those three. The second part was a disciple, brethren, the elect, and first fruit. And again, we showed last week how the Bible, the New Testament shows those four. I'm going to talk primarily about the children of God today. A child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God, children of God. That is my main identity. It probably is many of yours, maybe not everyone, maybe you identify with one of the others. That's your prerogative to do so. But before I actually get to the concept of children of God, there's some things I want to cover from the New Testament to kind of set the stage. And that's why when I saw what John Coffey was talking about, I got all excited because he talked about some of the things that would lead into the presentation today. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. What I'm going to show you today is that God does not focus on genealogy or nationality. Yes, there are the scriptures about that, and we, we don't ignore the scriptures about that. You know, God talks about genealogies, God talks about nationalities, and that's why when John Coffey talked about his presentation, he talked about the 144,000 on a physical level and on a spiritual level, because I think that is the more appropriate way to discuss these things. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, I just want you to notice if I were to ask you which of these three you were, what is the prominent one you are of these three? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. You know 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10 talk about not causing offense to other brethren, eating meats offered to idols in the, in the, in the square, out in, out in the village. You know, cutting people slack who do things slightly different than we do, or slightly different than I do or you do. But the concept, verse 32 says, give no offense, because that's the whole thing about not causing offense. But notice the three groups that Paul talked about. Seek not to offend the Jews, seek not to offend the Greeks, and seek not to offend the church of God. Of those three, where do you classify yourself as, a, as the primary one? Well, my primary one is the church of God. I view myself as part of the church of God. But I have to understand what is a Jew then, according to the Bible, and what is, what is the Greek, according to the Bible, and try to understand what it's talking about there on the physical level, because they're talking about nationalities there. So I want you to realize there's nationalities. Now, I'm not going to turn to all the scriptures in the Bible where, where the Bible does recognize genealogy and nationality. You've heard the phrase Abraham's seed. When you hear the phrase Abraham's seed, that's talking about nationality. That's talking about genealogy. And as could be pointed out in many presentations, you can look at that on a physical level and a spiritual level. But I'm telling you, brethren, I think many people in the church of God view some of their own genealogy and their own nationality more than they understand being part of the children of God. It's easy to do. It's not the end of the world when people do it because God is so merciful. But I, I want to encourage you to focus on being a child of God as opposed to the genealogy aspect of it. But there's many places in the Bible where it talks about Abraham's seed. Turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. Although there are many places in the Bible where it talks about the value of the blessing of a genealogy, because it's, it's a blessing to be part of Abraham's seed. That was a blessing. There's a blessing. So the physical genealogy can produce blessings. We don't want to ignore that. The Bible says that. But there is want to have the wrong emphasis on genealogy. Or if they want to have the wrong emphasis on nationality. This is here what they came to John the Baptist's baptism. 
And he was baptizing people left and right, and he was telling them to repent. Verse 8, he tells them to repent. And then they said, Think not to yourself, verse 9, We have Abraham as our father. See, that's focusing on a genealogy. That's, that's focusing on a nationality. And while I just said, and the Bible proves, that there's a lot of good things said about Abraham's seed, and a lot of blessings involved with that, the Bible warns not to get caught up in the wrong emphasis on genealogy or nationality. Now, see, people even do that with church congregations. They'll, they'll identify their church congregation as something special, and that's just as bad as focusing on a nationality or genealogy. In fact, it's probably crazier, because at least, at least you have DNA with, with a genealogy. You have, you have chromosomes with a nationality. If someone claims to be a special church, that's just a far-fetched opinion based on no science, based on no truth, based on no fact. You say, well, Dave, all the churches do that. Well, we don't do that, and there are other churches that don't do that either. But it's ridiculous to do it, quite frankly. I don't want to hurt their feelings, but it's ridiculous to do that. But here, they claimed specialness based on they looked at their genealogy. They looked at their nationality. We are Abraham is our father. We're Abraham's kids. What does that cut us? What break does that give us? He said, For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So again, God can easily work through a rock. He can work through a donkey. He can work through anything. So we don't want to overemphasize our genealogy. Look at John chapter 8. Another example. John chapter 8, verses 33 and 37. Another example of people using their genealogy and their nationality in a wrong way. As we've already said, and many scriptures will show, Abraham's seed is a blessing. But using your background as a way to be special is not in the card spiritual. That is not what God wants. Notice John chapter 8, verse 33. Because here's where Jesus was having the discussion with them. They were, they were actually kind of debating back and forth and arguing. He said in verse 32 that the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. So verse 33, the people answered and said, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. Why do we have to be free? Why are you giving us correction? We don't need your correction. We don't need your instruction because we are Abraham's descendants. You see the problem of using the genealogy and the nationality against the Christ himself? You say, well, you, you and I would never do that. Oh, really? I bet we do it from time to time. I bet when he gives us instruction, we look at it and say, ah, I don't need that instruction. I'm Abraham's descendants. Here's my nationality. Here's my genealogy. And some people would even say, I'm in the right church, so they don't need that instruction. But again here, verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. But you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. So you can have the right genealogy, you can have the right family, you can have the right criteria, but you know what, if you're hating me, that's not good. And I recognize when you're doing the wrong thing. So again, I'm making the point early in this presentation that genealogy can have blessing, but we cannot put a wrong emphasis on it. Let's look at the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Now let's look at the contrast between Jews and Gentiles. Let's look over some basic things that you know, but let's look over some basic things about the contrast between Jews and Gentiles. And I'm not going to list all the different places it's mentioned, but I have on the second page of the handout, the word Jew is used 195 times in the New Testament, and it simply means Jewish people. That's what it means. Now Gentile has basically two different Greek words for that. The one Greek word is always, well, it's mentioned Gentile 93 times, but it also talks about being, a, it can be a pagan nation, it can be a foreign nation, it can be a foreign people, and so that, that word is not always the same as a nationality, not, not, not the same nationality. The other Greek word, Helen, is it's also used now that is sometimes translated Greek 
and is sometimes translated Gentile. Twenty times it's either translated Greek or Gentile, and, and seven times it's translated, I mean, Greek or Greek, and sometimes Gentile. And it, it actually means a class of persons distinguished from the Jewish race and nations, not necessarily Greek. In other words, sometimes when it uses the word Greek, it's talking about a distinct nationality, Greece. And other times when it talks about Gentile, it can sometimes mean Greece, or it can sometimes just mean a different nation that is not Jewish. So sometimes you have to look at the, the, either the word itself or look at the context. Is it talking about the Greek people, or does the word Gentile just mean not Jewish? It's used both ways. But let's look here in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then also for the Greek. And the, the, the difference between the Jewish and the Greek people was how, who got the opportunity first? Who got the opportunity first? In the book of Romans, a number of times it mentions it, the salvation went to the, to the Jew first. Now let me just mention this, okay? I love the Jewish people. I probably, I can't say this for sure, but I probably have grown up around more Jewish people than anyone in this audience today. Having grown up in Pennsylvania, there are two groups of people I, I grew up around. Grew up a lot, around a lot of Italians and a lot of Jewish people. And I enjoy both cultures and I enjoy both peoples. In fact, now for those of you who don't watch much TV, the younger people would know this. There's a show called Impractical Jokers. It's, a, it's basically some people from New York City and having grown up two hours away from New York City, that is the way a lot of them act. They're not putting on. And at least Joe in that program is, is, is a, he's Italian. And I don't really know, the, I don't know all the others, what race, what nationality they are. But I, I'm so, I get so amused when I watch Joe on that show because he's, he's a, like many of the Italian families I grew up around. There's also a, uh, he, does a he does some shows he does uh, some comics shows. I won't say his name because I'm not recommending this guy because he uses a lot of bad language and so I can't recommend him because of his bad language. But he's, he's actually, he's actually uh, also from Italy, Italian. And I love his humor from the standpoint of, he describes the Italian families that I know. The point I'm making is, I've been around a lot of Italian nationality, I've been around a lot of Jewish nationality, and I love them, and I appreciate them. But I am neither Italian or Jewish. And when, when I say I'm not Jewish, I'm not, I'm not trying to slam it. I'm just saying I'm not Jewish. Friends, I'm not a spiritual Jew. Because sometimes many of the people at the Church of God call themselves spiritual Jews. Well, I think if you really understand what is, the Bible's talking about, you would not claim that. See, in other words, what people would say, Dave, are you Messianic Jew? No, I am not Messianic Jew. I would be more likely to have elements of Hebrew roots, but you have to define how, how much a person is Hebrew roots because some of the Hebrew roots people do things that I, would, I just don't do, have no interest in doing. However, the fact that I keep the seventh day Sabbath and the feast days, I am to a degree, as are you, you are to agree Hebrew roots. But someone might say, Dave, are you Messianic Jew? No, I am not. Messianic Jew means a Jewish person who believes in Christ as the Messiah and the Savior. But I'm not Jewish. I'm not trying to be Jewish. I'm Church of God. And I appreciate my Jewish friends. I appreciate my, my Jewish cohorts. But I am not Jewish. Now see, the Jewish people received the gospel first. And then the Greeks got it later. If you look at Romans 2 verses 9 and 10. Romans 2 verses 9 and 10, that there's going to be tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. The Jewish people first and the Greeks second. Timing. This is talking about the, the contrast between the Jew and the Greek in the New Testament time was timing. Jesus came as a Jewish son, as a Jewish person. So the Jewish religion and the Jewish customs played a big part in his life. 
Now, the fact that when we do the things we do, it's not because they're Jewish. We do the things we do because we find them in the Bible. And we think, we think those parts of the Old Testament that blend in with the New Testament are the things to do. But I am not Jewish, even though, even though I've been around more than you have, and I, pre, I, 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 I probably have more Jewish friends than you have. I, I support the, the, the nation of Israel against the Palestinians, but I'm, I'm just not Jewish. I don't want to be Jewish. I accept Christ the Savior. So I have Hebrew roots tendencies, as do you, but I don't view you as a, as a Messianic Jewish person. But see, a lot of people in the Church of God kind of like to view themselves a little bit Jewish. And I think that's technically a mistake. It also says in verse 10, but give glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Verse 9 said, if you do something bad, the Jews suffer the consequences first because they received it first. If you do something good, the Jewish people receive accolades first because they received it first. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew? Is there an advantage to being a Jewish person? He was writing to the people at Rome. Is there any profit? In verse 2 he says, the profit was, the value was, to them were committed the oracles of God. So they had access to certain oracles of God before the Greeks did. And that was an advantage. They were given an early access that was an advantage, according to Paul. Paul's writing this here. Verse 9, he says, What then? Are we Jewish people better than the Gentiles? Even though he said they had an advantage, he says, Not at all. Because both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. Then he has this long list of how people we have also, there's none righteous, meaning there's no Jewish and Gentile righteous. All of, them, all of us make mistakes. In verse 22, he says, the last phrase in verse 22, for there is no difference. There is no difference. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So again, he's talking here about the contrast between a Jewish person and a Greek person, or sometimes called a Gentile person. Romans 12, 10, verse 12. Paul makes this very, I think he makes it very clear. My personal opinion is the book of Romans is a lot clearer than the book of Galatians. That's my opinion. And that's why people can use the book of Galatians to either become confused or sometimes use it to promote their, their theology. I think the book of Romans is, is a lot clearer. R Romans 10 verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who came upon him. Okay, so again, was there an advantage? Yes, they had, the Jewish man and woman had earlier opportunity, and that opportunity came later to the Greeks and other Gentiles, people who are not Jewish. Now let's look over in, in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. See, if you're, you're paying attention, you say, okay, Dave, you're, you're nuking you're dismantling the overemphasis on the physical. Correct. I'm trying to have you not overemphasize the physical. Please do not overemphasize your genealogy, and please don't overemphasize your, uh, the, your nationality. Please don't do that. Now in Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. So again, if you are Christ, if, you're, if, you, are part of, if you are part of the Christian, the believer, the saint, the disciple, the brethren, the elect, the first fruit, or a child of God, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed in the way that matters the most, spiritually. Okay, so again, I, I pointed out there's different words in the, you can look up in the Strong's Concordance, you can look on the handout, how many times the word Jew is used, how many times the word Gentile is used, how many times the word Greek is used, and remember again, I'll remind you again, that sometimes when it says the word Greek, it, it generally means the Greek or Greek language. When it uses the word Gentile, it can be talking specifically about a Greek person, or it can be talking about someone who is not Jewish. Okay, so that way you understand the terms. 
Now let's look at Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Now, let's talk about Israelites as a nationality. And of course, you realize that the Jewish tribe it came from Judah. And being from Judah, they are part of the tribes of Israel. So again, am I, am I an Israelite? Well, I don't, I don't know if I am or not. The Israelites were scattered. The tribes were scattered. I don't know, I don't know if I'm physically an Israelite or not. My roots come from Czechoslovakia, especially the branch of Czechoslovakia that's called Slovak. And of course, I, I've jokingly told people before that uh, the Slovaks were slaves. My history, my history of my longtime family is my people were slaves. And the thing is, I say, well, do you try to get reparations for that? No, no. Uh, you, do you view yourself as a victim? No, no. What, what value is that? That's, Let's move on. Just because my people were mistreated, just because my nationality was just mistreated, why do I want to live in the past? I don't, I, why do I want to follow politicians' brainwashing to not react appropriately? I jokingly have said, and I, I, I jokingly have said that we helped win World War II for the Allies because Hitler was going to go over to over into Russia, who have Eastern Russia, Western Russia has Slavic people as well. But he spent some time messing with Czechoslovakia and some of the other nations there. And we slowed him down, we, my ancestors, slowed him down enough that he got a later start into Russia. Of course, the later start into Russia meant the winter came. However, let me just quickly add, if God was involved in World War II, he was going to make it snow whenever he wanted to make it snow. However, you know, however involved he was, he was going to make it go his way. But he had a hatred for the Slavic people based on my reading. And his hatred for the Slavic people was he tried to inflict a lot of damage. And from a technical point of view, it delayed his going into Russia. Again, God would have probably worked it out the way he was going to anyway. But so, is it possible, because we know the tribes of Israel are scattered. It's possible that I have part Israel, physical Israel nationality in me. It's very possible. But I don't care. In other words, if I impart Israel, if I'm, again, the biblical point of view, great. But if I'm not, great. So I'm either going to be a Jewish descent nationality, excuse me, or Israelite descent nationality. Let me correct that. I'm either going to be Israelite descent nationality, or I'm going to be solely Gentile, non-Israel. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Now, notice what Paul said. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So again, he's asserting here his physical nationality. And he, he would assert his physical nationality when he's trying to reach people making a point. But again, the fact is we are not, most of us are not from the tribe of Benjamin. And we may find out some of us are, well, as, a, as a people who hear this message. But again, so we do know that Israelites had a nationality. Let's look at Romans chapter 9. This is a segment, by the way, I've made the statement to John Coffey. I really appreciate his Bible studies and his approach. And when I read verse 4, but we're going to start in verse 3. When I read Romans 9 verse 4, that could be a series of sermons by itself or it could just be a good long sermon or a good Bible study. And that's the kind of Bible study I'd love to see John Coffey sink his teeth into. Or... I would have loved to have heard Bernie Monsavo sink his teeth into it because they get into there and they dig it out and they can make it live. But I want you to read this, Romans 9, verses 3 through 8. Romans 9, verses 3 through 8. Let's see. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, my countrymen according to the flesh. Okay, again, countrymen according to the flesh is nationality, genealogy, it's physical. Now notice how he describes his, the Israelites. Six things he mentions about the Israelites. Like I said, this could be a series of six studies or it could be one good full sermon. To Israelites, the physical Israelites who pertain the adoption, so what does that mean? The glory, what does that mean? The covenants, what does that mean? The giving of the law, how was that implemented? The service of God, what does that talk about? 
and the promises. So again, that would be a way to describe what physical Israel dealt with, what they received from God. And you can learn the history of the physical Israel, what they received, and then we could learn spiritual lessons from it. I was telling some people before the sermon today, I don't understand when some of the full-time pastors who are paid to speak, when they say they don't, they don't have, they can't think of a subject to talk about. Man, my problem is just the opposite. I've got too many subjects to talk about. Look, look at that. That verse, that verse four there could be six Bible studies in a row. It could be wonderful. But then it goes on to say, of whom are the fathers for whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. Christ came from them, who is over all the eternity blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Hmm. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Well, John mentioned that a little bit in his presentation. For they are not all, for nor are they all the children of because they are the seed of Abraham. It says, In Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, verse 8, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So again, if someone were to say that all physical Israelites are the children of God, they may be the children of God by nationality, but they're not of the children of God in, in the overall big picture view. And he was referring to that again of the 144,000. Just because they could be listed in a group. They, again, they may be listed in a group based on their, their genealogy and nationality, but are they part of the spiritual thing of God? They say, okay, Dave, I get what you're doing here. You're, you're spending all this time to now get to the point I'm really wanting to talk about. Just because someone claims to be a child of God does not make them a child of God. Now, but I'm hoping you will have, find your identity as being a child of God, no matter what your nationality is, no matter what your genealogy is. I hope you can view yourself as a child of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. This is, the, this is the scripture where it talks about sons and daughters. Because if you read in the New Testament, it talks about children of God, child of God, Son of God, but look at this, first, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18. I'll start reading verse 17. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Verse 18, what we want to focus on. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And again, that's why this is... This is the identity I love the most. I don't ignore the other identities, but this is the one I love the most. And that's why for years now, I've been trying to get you to look at God as a perfect father. And every time I bring this up, I have to remind us, none of us has been a perfect father. None of us has had a perfect father. So don't let the imperfections of your experience cause you to, to underestimate the analogy, to underestimate the relationship. Because the more we can focus on God as a perfect father, I think the more the way of God opens up to you. Grace opens up to you. God's expectations open up to you. As a dad who says, I love you, kid, but here's what I want you to do. And it can open it up where it's no longer any part of legalism, but it can be opening it up to really doing something because of appreciation for what your dad has done. A perfect dad. And while I appreciate other, all, all the other identifications, this is the identity that inspires me, encourages me, motivates me, and sometimes corrects me. Because if, I don't want to disappoint my dad. I don't want to disappoint the family name. And I don't know what the exact family name is going to be in the resurrection. I don't think it's been told to us yet. But I don't want to disappoint my dad. Not as because I think he's going to wipe us out. I found the interactive study to be encouraging. One simple little thing that John mentioned in the interactive study and mentioned in his presentation. When he talked about the 144,000, he talked about that would be that many at least. In other words, that, see, because so many churches put that as the maximum. We were talking, there's some churches out there who think 
144,000 are going to be everyone from Abel all the way up to the end time. Counting all New Testament and Old Testament saints. Do you see how restrictive that is? Where John's presentation and helping us understand the idioms or understand the, the metaphor, helping us understand that, it's helping to realize God's way is not restrictive. I mean, yes, God can say no. God can say this is what I do, will do, and won't do. But it's more positive. And I, hit th I think most of the other approaches you hear from other Church of God denominations is so narrow, it makes people fearful. It makes them nervous. And I think if you look at God as a, a wonderful, loving dad, you're going to have a more positive approach towards salvation, a more positive approach to obedience. And if you, if you accept God's love better, you're going to do a better job of giving God's love. All right, I, on the handout, I've got a lot of places it talks about the, the family of God. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read just a couple of my favorite ones here. Romans 8, beginning verse 14. I love this one. Okay, Romans 8, beginning verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Okay. If you're led by the Spirit of God, Paul called you the, the Son of God, which would imply also a daughter of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. I know we say this regularly that we want to have respect for God, but I keep pointing out we don't want to have a fear religion where we're, oh no, and just be terrified. I hope, again, if you were terrified of your physical dad, I'm sorry. I hope you've forgiven him, but I hope you've learned to grow past that, that you don't have a fear religion toward your spiritual dad. But you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, we call him Abba, Father. We call him, he, he's our dad. The spirit itself bears itself witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if you're a child of God, you're an heir. I'm at the age where I'm thinking more about what we're going to pass on to our boys. What we're going to pass on to our grandchildren. I'm more at that age now, starting to think about that more. And even though I won't have a lot to pass on, they are, they are heirs of what I can accumulate to pass on to them to make their life a blessing to them. My wife and I discuss that. We talk about it. and We want to spend the rest of our great years on earth trying to help pass on gifts and things to our children and, and grandchildren. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So if you understand God as a father, you understand it. You could understand an inheritance. And if you understand an inheritance, you can understand what your dad wants to give you. And if he called, Paul called you a joint heir with Christ. <laughs> wow. Does that give you any confidence at all? Not in the, how great you and I are. Does that give you any confidence at all in your position on this earth? Your spot on this earth? If you're a joint heir with Christ, what, what did the Father give Christ? And why shouldn't you have the same thing? I think, uh, to me, the analogy really helps. Now, indeed, we may have to suffer with him that we may be glorified together. So there are challenges in life. There's suffering in life. Physical, emotional, spiritual. Sufferings from people. Sufferings within our own body. Sufferings from the environment. Sufferings many ways. We have to, that's why we can't be victims. We have to deal with what life brings. And even some of the, the people we know, friends of ours, the, poor, the, the bald family, their, their, their sister, Carol's sister-in-law, going through a horrible, horrible trial. And I just ache for that. I hope you do. I mean, we need to try, we'll try to get more details so you can ache for them too, going through the trials they go through. I mean, those trials are huge. And I, I would hope that the, the information I gave in the other two sermons could help them. I, I wish the information that this could be given to them, that they, I'm sure they recognize being a child of God. That's what sees them through. It doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the disappointment. But what sees us through during those times? And that's what I'm thinking, this precious truth we're talking about can see us through. Verse 9, the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The world doesn't know it yet, but they're waiting for the plan of God to be unveiled. 
And when the plan of God is unveiled, it's going to involve the sons and daughters of God. They're waiting for something. They want the resolution, but they don't understand what the resolution is. And so even though that, and we, maybe we can tell them, maybe we can't. But certainly we want to act like the right children. So when it happens, we can be glorious lights to them. One final section of scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. Like I said, there's many more. You can look up everywhere in the Bible. It talks about sons of God. And it's, they're very positive verses. But I just want to remind you about this from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning, beginning in verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to us as sons. This is taken from the book of Proverbs. My son, do not despise the correction of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So we as children, we accept God's mercy and love. We, ac we accept the salvation, but we have to also accept his correction. Because his correct, our correction is not always motivated by love. I would bet that when you corrected your children, most of the time it was motivated by love. I'd like to think that the high, high majority of the times I corrected my kids, and now I correct my grandchildren, which they don't get nearly as much correction as my kids got. But I would like to think that most of my correction was motivated by love. Maybe when I was tired, it wasn't perfect. Maybe when I was frustrated, it wasn't perfect. Uh, maybe just because I was stupid, it wasn't perfect. But I would say most of the time, most of the time, my correction I would say most of the time I've ever corrected the members of our congregation, most of the time it's been motivated out of love. I would say almost all the time. Now, if you and I can do that, can't we believe that all of God's correction is motivated by love? If you endure the correction, God deals with you as with a son. For what son is there who a father doesn't correct? You love your kids, you're going to correct them Cor appropriately. But if you are without correction, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate, not sons. Are you really a son if a, God does, if a dad doesn't care about you? Are you just a nuisance? Again, we're talking about the perfect God. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who've corrected us, and we respected them. How much more should we be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and live? Why can't we figure it out this, to support our real spiritual dad is... The real thing to do. For they indeed are a few days. People are chasing. It seems best for them. But he is for our profit. In other words. Correction doesn't feel good. But it is designed to help us. Because he, our dad wants us to be a partakers of his holiness. That's why he corrects us. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It can even seem painful. Nevertheless afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. To those who have been trained by it. Correction is never fun to receive. And quite frankly, I don't find correction fun to give out. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like dishing it out. I, and I try to do it the best I can, and, and I appreciate people who dish it out to me the best that they can. I, I just appreciate that so much better. But we have to grow. But growing is not a matter of fear, like, oh, no. And growing is a matter of a scenario where our dad loves us, he wants to take care of us, he wants to give us an inheritance. And son, this will make me proud. Son, this is what havers do, or stick your name in there. Son, this is, this is what we, we, we got, this is what I expect. I want you to be an example, not God talking to us. God wants us to be an example, to be children of light. There's so many good, good said, things said in here that I hope you will allow the ex example of the family being children of God, to motivate you in a positive way. So I rushed through that. You can look at the handout. You can think about it in greater detail. I can always come back and re review it again in weeks from now when I start fresh with it. But brethren, I hope you'll view yourself as a Christian, a believer, a saint, a disciple, a brother, the elect, a first fruit, and a child of God. You pick the one that motivates you the best. Find good qualities of all of them. Let all of them motivate you. I'm just telling you as your friend, while I value all the others, 
I do, value, I do appreciate, and I do appreciate the fact that I'm a child of God. And I hope then that you look at these things, look at those characteristics, and others, you'll find others in there, and I hope you'll, have, you'll find your identity, your spiritual identity with God.